Hello, um, I'm Dr. Eric Davis. I'm the medical director of Shikshedo Hospital in Seattle, Washington. If you are watching this presentation, you may be contemplating for yourself or for someone you care about seeking treatment for a substance use disorder. This brief presentation is to assist you in making a decision about whether to contact Shikshedo Hospital about care. First of all, let me um, state that my job here at Shikshedo Hospital is to ensure that the efficacy of the treatments that we provide deliver the desired result and that the effectiveness of our treatment program, which we measure as abstinence at 12 to 15 months after you leave treatment, is what we like also. That's primarily my job here. First of all, let me say that um, <clears throat> this treatment program has always embraced the medical model of substance use disorders going back to its origin in the early 1930s. We continue to embrace that model of looking at substance use disorders, which is aligned with the American Society of Addiction Medicine's model of substance use disorders as a chronic brain disorder. I want to start this a conversation with telling you um, about Shikshedo Hospital and how we are different, how we follow that model, but also how we're the same as many other treatment programs in the United States. First of all, uh, we deliver a treatment called counter conditioning treatment. Counter conditioning treatment is a mechanism, a treatment that is intended to produce an aversion. This is a very unique aspect of the treatment program at Shikshedo Hospital and is not offered anywhere else in the rest of the United States to the best of my knowledge. Uh, we'll talk about counter conditioning treatment and aversions in a moment, but I want to go on and point out the other aspects of the treatment program that are unique and also shared with other places. Second, we offer a type of treatment called rehabilitation interview. If you look in the literature, you would search under amitol interviewing or drug-assisted hypnotherapy to look up information about this treatment. We use the term rehabilitation interview here to describe this treatment, and I will tell you about that in a moment, why we give this treatment and what it's intended to do. The third thing that's um, different about this treatment program is its brevity. If you come to this hospital, you may or may not need medical detoxification. Um, if you do, we will provide that service for you. And then we will place you in our inpatient 10-day treatment program and strongly recommend that you return for two two-day follow-ups at 30 and 90 days post-discharge. So ignoring the length of stay for detoxification if necessary, you would be an inpatient or a resident for 14 days over a period of three months. This is about half the length of stay that you would be in most residential treatment programs in the United States. So it's quite brief compared to most residential or other inpatient treatment programs in the United States. A third way this treatment program is different is that we do not embrace nor do we utilize 12-step self-help model. We are very supportive of people utilizing 12-step and self-help when they leave our hospital um, as a part of their aftercare and for support, but we do not incorporate it into our treatment model here at the hospital. What we do incorporate is the SMART program, which stands for Self-Management and Recovery Treatment. This is an evidence-based program and very much um, like cognitive behavioral therapies, which we also include. We also include journaling and di diarying as a part of our treatment program also. Um, so those are the major differences in this treatment program and also the major similarities as it relates to other treatment programs in the United States. So let's uh, step back for a moment and talk about uh, what we do treat at this hospital. Uh, we treat uh, substance use disordered patients who have a substance use disorder of one of 
or a combination of five substances. Those include alcohol, opioids or opiates, cannabis, and the stimulants methamphetamine and cocaine. Those are the five primary substances that we treat. We will treat patients who have up to three of these uh, substances as a problem at one time. More than three, we cannot treat in this, in this program. We call those folks polysubstance users, and they may be best served in another treatment program. Also, a number, <clears throat> a number of, excuse me, a number of people will um, have what's called a secondary substance use disorder. These are folks who have a primary psychiatric disorder, and we also will treat those folks for their substance use disorder as long as their primary psychiatric disorder is stable and well managed. So those are the kinds of substance use disorders that we treat at this facility. Um, another group of people that we don't treat are intravenous drug users. So um, we will consider the treatment of a person with intravenous drug using as long as it's been a year, a full year since their last use of intravenous drugs and they have switched or changed to another route of using the drug. So let's uh, go back and talk about uh, some of the uh, treatment components that I've um, um, presented to you. First um, is counter conditioning treatment. The purpose of counter conditioning treatment is to create an aversion. An aversion is simply in a situation in which a person would usually have a strong desire, urge, or a craving for a substance. They no longer have that urge or craving or desire. Uh, that response is replaced with a neutral response and actually uh, an actual physical unpleasant response and or a psychological unpleasant response or any combination of those three physical psychological um, and um, neutrality uh, we have two ways of accomplishing an aversion um, one is called chemical counter conditioning treatment and the other is called phoratic counter conditioning treatment um, the reason that an aversion is important is that when substance using patients are asked what is the major reason that they relapse they say that they have overwhelming urges desires or craving to use a substance to seek out a substance and use a substance in a situation that is difficult that is distressing both intrapsychically or also um, environmentally uh, so for example someone who has um, an anger uh, response to a situation and would generally respond by having a desire or craving to use the substance in order to deal with that anger that would be called intrapsychic. Um, someone who has an environmental situation that's distressing for example um, uh, having to deal with a DUI uh, this might be a situation in which a, in which a person also has craving and um, uh, would reach for a substance to deal with that situation. The other major situation in which people report relapse is when they are in an environment in which they are having pressure put on them to use a substance. An aversion can be helpful in this situation also um, as it is easier for the person to use their refusal and their avoidance skills which we will teach you to get good at while you are here in the hospital as a part of the SMART or the Cognitive Behavioral Treatment Program. So uh, to talk just a little bit more about an aversion, um, the aversion that we create uh, here at the hospital for you is what's called smell taste aversion. Now most of taste is smell. If you can't smell you generally can't taste. So this is uh, predominantly a smell-based um, aversion. The reason for that is that uh, smell memory 
is the strongest and most indelible memory that your brain can form. And for this reason, uh, we use uh, an aversive technique that relies upon a smell-based memory. Um, so that's, um, that's the way that we approach um, creating that uh, memory. In addition, um, this is mostly nausea-based uh, because nausea is an extremely aversive and unpleasant human experience. And that results in the physical uh, component of the aversion that I mentioned before um, that um, you will develop um, in the treatment program here. Um, moving on, I want to talk about the rehabilitation interview, which I alluded to in the literature as being called amitol interviewing or drug-assisted hypnotherapy. We use this um, treatment for several purposes. Uh, first of all, um, uh, we use a medication called propofol, and we put you in a state of minimal or conscious sedation. Uh, this treatment is provided by a nurse anesthetist with also a counselor scribe who will conduct the treatment. Uh, the purposes of these uh, treatments are first of all to interview the patient and to um, confirm and get information about situations in which the patient is most likely to lapse or slip or have a relapse so that this can be used in the other parts of treatment. Um, when people are under the influence of the drug, they're oftentimes um, more forthcoming about sharing this information. And so we have scripted interviews that allow us to get this information that can be later used um, to identify cues and triggers, some of which can be unconscious um, to assist the, uh, the person in their aversion development and also in terms of their counseling and therapy. Um, another w reason that we conduct this treatment is that uh, patients are in a hypnotic state and are more likely to um, follow direction. We call this hypersuggestibility. And so we make a series of post-hypnotic or favorable or, um, or positive suggestions that are intended to enhance the patient's motivation for treatment and their success in treatment. Third reason that we do these uh, treatments is that it provides us another mechanism for monitoring how the aversion is developing throughout the course of treatment and gives us an idea of whether we need to make changes in the conduct of the counter conditioning treatment related to the development of the aversion. And finally, we give these treatments on alternate days from the counter conditioning treatments. So they provide a day of respite and reflection and participating in um, other treatments, uh, mostly counseling and education, between the counter-conditioning days. So those are the two major medical interventions that we use um, at the hospital um, to treat patients. Um, as I said, we also use cognitive behavioral therapies and the SMART program, as well as education and bibliotherapy as well as journaling. In addition, there is a significant um, peer uh, involvement uh, with other patients here at the hospital, which provides a very supportive um, environment that's helpful to people um, in their treatment. So uh, let's uh, step back for a minute and um, uh, talk also about um, another component of the treatment program which is called contingency management. Contingency management is a form of uh, reinforcement um, that helps a person um, uh, toward their goals. Uh, this particular very strong intervention um, is what is um, included in our reinforcements which we call recaps here at the hospital. After a patient completes the initial 10 days of treatment, they will uh, be given an appointment for a 30-day follow-up where they return to the hospital for two days and one night. Um, during this visit, the patient will receive one rehabilitation interview and one counter-conditioning treatment. The purpose of the counter-conditioning treatment 
is to reinforce or to boost the aversion so that it maintains itself for a longer period of time. Like any kind of learning, an aversion is a type of learning based upon memory. It can be forgotten or it can be mitigated. So this treatment is intended at 30 days to promote and to boost that memory for a longer period of time. The other purpose of uh, this, rehabilit uh, this uh, reinforcement is to conduct the rehabilitation interview to interview the patient and to see if there's any new or different issues uh, that need to be included in their aftercare plan and to review how they're doing. Uh, the same process occurs at 90 days to extend or boost the aversion um, and to also see if the aftercare plan needs um, some adjustment um, to help the person get through uh, that first year after uh, treatment. The 30 and 90 day periods are chosen based upon science. We know that the vast majority of patients who are going to relapse do so in the first 90 days and the vast majority of patients that relapse in the first 90 days do so in the first 30 days. The best predictor of abstinence at 90 days post-treatment is being abstinent at 30 days and the best predictor of abstinence at 12 months following treatment is abstinence at 90 days. Those are the reasons that we choose those two time periods um, in order to um, boost the aversion and to help people remain abstinent. Speaking of abstinence, this is an abstinence-based treatment program. Um, it is not a harm reduction focused treatment program and um, for patients who complete our alcohol counter conditioning treatment program and come back for the two recaps or reinforcements we generally expect two out of every three patients to be abstinent continuously based upon our history at one year post second recap which is 15 months after the original discharge for our opiate opioid patients that number is about one out of two at one year or 12 or 15 months post initial discharge. And for the other substances, it ranges um, up to uh, two out of every three and as low as one out of every two. This is contingent upon the person completing the treatment program and both of the uh, reinforcements. I hope this presentation has been helpful to you um, and learning about the treatment programs at Shikshedo Hospital. If you wish to follow up, please call the phone number that's on the website and we will provide you with further information about our treatment programs. Thank you.